Welcome to Local Matters. I'm Elizabeth. Let's get started. The state of Massachusetts is home to over 100 species of butterfly, and watching these beautiful creatures can be a meditative experience that reduces stress and connects us to the natural world. On May 5th at 6.30 p.m., join the Plymouth Public Library and Plymouth County entomologist Blake Dinius for The Magic of Butterflies. This virtual workshop will detail the benefits of butterfly watching, butterfly identification, and what you can do to get started. Visit the library's website to sign up. On May 12th at 8 p.m., the Kingston Public Library parking lot transforms into a drive-in theater. The film showing will be Stefano, the true story of Shakespeare's shipwreck, 90 minutes following the story of Stephen Hopkins, the only Mayflower passenger who had been to North America previously. In an intersection of history, Hopkins had been in attendance at the marriage of Pocahontas and John Rolfe, which led him to escape from Jamestown and travel back to England with Pocahontas and her husband. Producer Andrew Giles Buckley, a descendant of Hopkins, grew up hearing stories of the man who may have been the inspiration for the drunken and boisterous Stefano in Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. This personal connection inspired the film shot on location in both Plymouth, Massachusetts, Plymouth, England, and many of the surrounding historic towns and villages. Enjoy this intriguing and history-based film with your family under the stars in the comfort and safety of your own vehicle. To register for this free event, visit the Kingston Public Library website. Whale and Dolphin Conservation's North American office is right here in Plymouth, and Julie invited Executive Director Regina Asmutis and Education Coordinator Stephen McCloskey on to talk about the vision of a world where every whale and dolphin is safe and free. Regina and Steve, thank you so much for joining me today. We're, we're thrilled to have you. Regina, as the executive director, can you tell the audience the focus of the, um, the conservation overall and, and specifically here in our, our region of, of New England? Uh, sure. So Whale and Dolphin Conservation is actually a global organization and our North American headquarters are in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And our focus here in North America is largely to protect uh, many species of animals in the marine environment. We have a focus on humpback whales, uh, critically endangered North Atlantic right whales here on the East Coast, and also Southern resident orcas on the West Coast. So uh, those are some of our major program areas. We try to do a lot of boater outreach. We um, work with fishermen to try and improve uh, different kinds of fishing gear to reduce entanglements. And uh, we're also trying to reduce vessel strikes. Uh, so that's kind of a, a lot of the focus of what we do in the in, in our area and in, in Plymouth in particular, uh, I, you know, we have a, a, a real big focus on critically endangered North Atlantic right whales, a species of which there are fewer than 360 left in the entire world. And they use Cape Cod Bay as a feeding area and nursery in the spring. So they, they are literally one of the most endangered animals that are in your backyard. Wow, and they've been seen recently right off the coast of Plymouth, correct? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool because you can actually stand on some of the different regions of, of Cliffs of Plymouth or even up in Duxbury Beach, Whitehorse Beach, Manomet Point, uh, Cedarville. And if they are, you know, within a few miles of the coast, sometimes feeding, you can, you can stand on the beach and see them. So it's pretty amazing. The Center for Coastal Studies does aerial surveys pretty regularly in the bay. And on Saturday, they flew and they had 80 right whales in, in Cape Cod Bay. So um, they're, they are around right now and it's it's pretty amazing. They're, they're uh, flying again today, so we'll find out uh, who's out there today. So a quarter of the entire population in the world of the right whales were actually off Plymouth? Yep, on Saturday. Wow. And so it's it's um, it's amazing. And it's it's one of the, like I said, it's one of the most endangered animals on the planet. And, you know, we, we have them in our, in our backyard and um, there's a lot of work. Massachusetts does a ton, a ton of work to, to help to protect them. So this is a, a pretty cool state to be in, in sure. for the sake of those whales. Absolutely. Can you tell me how long is the, is the reproductive process for the right whale? How long would it take them to, let's say, double their population? Uh, a really long time, unfortunately. They, they're pregnant for about a year. And then the calf stays with the mom for uh, the first year of its life. And it's, it's a, it's a, it's a 
not an easy thing to be a right whale mom. So you're the sole caretaker of the calf. Um, the, the dads don't have anything to do with rearing the calves. Calves nurse on about 40 to 60 gallons of milk a day. So it's a lot of energy. And the moms actually give birth down in the Southeast of the US. So Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas area. And then they'll you know, make that journey up to Cape Cod Bay. And then sometimes after they feed in Cape Cod Bay, they'll go further up into Canada into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. So lots and lots of traveling um, with, a, with a kid by your side that you're trying to you know, protect. And so it's a very energetically expensive um, behavior for the, the moms to be able to have and care for that calf. Um, unfortunately, because of that, the calving intervals, uh, the, the number of calves they have is only one at a time because it, it takes so much energy. So they're having twins and triplets. Um, but they're actually, because it takes so much energy uh, to do that, the calving intervals have actually increased. So they're, they're sometimes only having one calf um, every, every you know, 10 to 15 years. So it takes a really long time for them to be able to sort of repopulate that population. And, and right. then they should be living to like 100 years old, but unfortunately, because of human threats, um, they're only living to, you know, maybe into their 40s or 50s. Uh, so they're, they take a long time to have kids and their lifespan has been shortened, unfortunately. Right. So, so the, the statistics um, are working against them, unfortunately, at this point. So what can, what can the average citizen do to help protect these gorgeous creatures? So I, I, a lot and lots and lots of things. And I think that, that one of the things that we're really excited about this year, there were 17 calves born. That's huge. That's more than the, the three previous years combined. Um, so we're seeing some you know, positive trends and we just need to kind of keep them alive to keep that happening. And I think that you know, something as simple as if you have a smartphone, you, you download, there's, a, there's an app called Whale Alert and you can actually just call in the sightings or report the sightings um, because those sightings then NOAA uses them to let ships know that there's right whales in the area. So it's a way to help to protect them. Um, so just reporting a sighting is easy. Um, something simple like picking up some trash on the beach sounds kind of cliche, um, but we've actually had a couple of different uh, whales in the past, uh, a uh, different endangered whale, a stay whale, and also a, a whale called a rice's whale, um, both of whom died because they had pieces of plastic in their stomach that cut up their stomach lining. Oh, so one was awful. a broken DVD cover and one was just another piece of sharp plastic. So like seeing something on the beach that you think like, oh, it's not a big deal. Um, it could be really a big deal. You could literally save a whale. Right. Just Pick it up. Trash okay. up. So, okay. and I think, I think the last thing too, like we, we live in Plymouth and we're in, you know, Massachusetts, like I said, the Division of Marine Fisheries Service does a great job here. Um, but they balance, they very much balance the needs of the fishermen with the whales. And yeah. um, there's a lot of restrictions here for, for the fishing industry to help to protect these whales. So, you know, I would say very much support, you know, Massachusetts um, lobster fishing. So don't, you know, you don't need to go to Maine, um, buy, buy lobsters that were fished in Massachusetts because these guys right. are under a lot more restrictions and right. they're doing a lot more to protect. Buy yeah. local, another reason to buy local. Okay, Steve, yeah. let's talk about, now you're the um, education coordinator and I would think that's hugely important is, is, is educating people as to what they can do. So talk to me about your job and your function, what you do. Sure, so that's correct. I'm the education coordinator at the Whale and Dolphin Conservation. And right now, um, we believe like a primary pillar of our education program should be uh, formal education or, or classroom learning. So better supporting uh, teachers and students where they are in the classroom. And so that with the activities that we create, uh, they're more relevant and they're more engaging. So a big effort we've undertook is aligning ourselves, rooting ourselves in the next generation science standards are in the education world, more commonly referred to as NGSS. And NGSS is essentially standards that were created by the National Science Teacher Association, the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the National Research Council back in 2013. And essentially what NGSS does is it provides performance expectations, which are essentially the goals that students should be meeting at the end of each grade. And those goals are related to different scientific concepts and practices and the depth of each that students should be able to demonstrate at the end of each grade. 
And NGSS is also really cool because it allows the, the individual teacher to get students to those performance ex expectations as they best see fit. So by rooting our education efforts with NGSS, we can better create whale and ocean-based activities uh, to advance student learning and understanding towards these performance expectations. And also at the same time, we create a more natural sequencing for students to build knowledge from grade to grade, from elementary school to middle school. And then, yeah. And then the last thing I would say is with the activities we develop, we want to embrace student curiosity. So it's our intention um, to create activities that are inquiry-based and um, are also looking at a natural phenomena. Sure, excellent. And I know, kids around here always went to the aquarium. That was one of the trips that you took um, when you were in either grade school or middle school. Um, I think yeah. children naturally are fascinated with um, the creatures of the sea. And these, these whales are so magnificent that I would think you have a built-in um, really exciting subject matter to, to, uh, to let kids study and really learn about and understand the dynamics of how endangered they are. So uh, if a teacher or camp director wanted to uh, bring some of your programs into their classroom or into their camp, how would they do that? What would that look like? Sure, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think our education effort and program is pretty flexible and malleable. Like we wanna, we wanna support uh, different teachers or different different informal education settings as best as possible. So I would say um, to collaborate with us, you can you can get onto our website, uh, get onto our Education Nation webpage, look at the activities we have. Um, and if you don't see something on that website, but you're still curious if we have something or if we can collaborate, you're always free to reach out. Um, you can contact us by phone, by email. Uh, we also have this really cool uh, inflatable North Atlantic right whale uh, that you can go inside and see the anatomy and, and have a more immersive experience. So that's something that we bring out to different schools uh, and outreach events. So that's a really cool experience to engage people as well. So we are, we are really flexible with working with different organizations. I mean, science is a very collaborative process. And so we believe education should be that way as well. Absolutely. Great. Okay, so we're going to put all the information about how to get in touch with your organization um, up on our screen. Is there any last words, Regina, that you, you want to shout out to people about, about your organization and how important the work is that you're doing? No, I, I would just um, say that we are, we're trying really hard to get the word out about how important whales are to the environment and that they, they have this incredibly important function as the ocean gardeners. And they literally fertilize this forest of phytoplankton that gives you every other breath you take. So they're not just cool. They're not just smart. They're super, super important. And, and our lives and our planet literally depend on them. So um, whether you're supporting WDC or you're going to support another organization that's, that's trying to help whales, I would really just encourage people to to go out there and do what they can to help save these animals because we need them. And uh, we run something called the Whale Adoption Project. So you can adopt a whale through us if you'd like to. Uh, and we give you updates on that particular individual and who they're with and who they're hanging out with. But again, if uh, whatever organization you support, I would, I would just really reinforce that whales are super cool, but they're also super important. So we, we really want you to do what you can to help us protect them. Great, excellent, that's wonderful. Wonderfully said, we're all connected in this great world, the people and the planet and everything in between. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today and um, I'm sure we'll hear more about the whales in the future. Thanks for having us. Thank you. To learn more, visit whales.org. In the same way your favorite song can lift your mood, sound has a deep connection to the human mind and can improve the ways that we handle stress and anxiety in our lives. Join the Plymouth Public Library on May 10th from 6 to 7 p.m. for the online workshop, Nourishing Your Health Through Sound, Stress and Anxiety Relief. You'll learn about a variety of sound-based techniques and practice using them for a 20-minute sound meditation, which will also be available for download. Visit the Plymouth Public Library website to sign up. Are you a Kingston resident looking for a volunteer opportunity in town? The Kingston Council on Aging would love your help. 
They are seeking Meals on Wheels drivers to substitute for Monday through Friday morning shifts, a bingo caller on Thursdays from 12.30 to 3.30 p.m., and a programs greeter on Friday from 9 to 11 a.m. If you're available and would like to lend a hand, please contact Brenda Fitzgerald at 781-831-6042. From seed to harvest, green energy to green living, your green space features ways you can keep your home, house, and body feeling green. Here's Erica. Permaculture and sustainable living are both holistic worldviews that are respectful of the symbiotic relationship between human beings and the earth we inhabit. A combination of the words permanent and agriculture, permaculture is the conscious design and harmonious integration of the landscape and ecological farming, gardening, and living. The philosophy behind it is to turn problems into opportunities and wastes into resources. On this episode of Your Green Space, we follow Jackie Miller of Terracura through her backyard as she shows us how we can practice permaculture in our own lives. Let's get started. My name is Jackie Miller and I practice permaculture at my house. I was also a co-founder of an organization called Terra Cura and permaculture really means land care, people care, fair share. So at your own home you can do multiple things that will make the world a better place by acting really hyper locally. And today we're going to show you some of the things I did at my house which you can certainly do at your house as well. And in permaculture you keep anything anybody ever gives you. So if they give you lattice they give you parts of a fence, you keep it because you're going to use it at some point. You're going to make it into a trellis for um, vertical planting. So keep anything anybody gives you. So in permaculture, an herb spiral is one of the permaculture principles. This is an herb spiral which allows you to have herbs all year round. These are all perennial herbs. So we've got sage, we've got oregano, We've also got some strawberries, which will come back every year as well. So this is great to have all year round. We've got chives down here. And this is also reused material. So we've got bricks, we've got soil, and you build it up so the more arid plants are at the top and the more water loving ones are down at the bottom. But this is a great thing to put in your yard as well. Get a couple friends, find some bricks or stones, and this holds the heat. And that's why you've got such gorgeous looking plants right now even when it's November. And again, the strawberries are ever bearing and there's nothing like a fun, fresh strawberry in the spring. So here's the back garden. This garden's been here for a long time. So if you can build a raised bed garden attached to something, that helps a great deal because the soil's gonna stay nice and moist. You're also gonna be able to add amendments to the soil and it's not so big and kind of sprawling. So this garden, I started to clean up this half and again, if you have anything that's a perennial herb, this is oregano. This is gonna be great and it's gonna be delicious and it smells wonderful. So you can pick that almost all year round. All this stuff's gonna come down. Anything that is an annual, like a tomato or any of the sunflowers, boop, we're gonna get rid of them. This, you know, I really like to seed save and these are marigolds. So if you have kids or you just want something to do, you just come out and you pull off all the seed heads. And I get a brown paper bag, I write marigold on it, and I pop them in. And then in the winter time, you can just break them apart, get some seed packages, and just pack them away. And then you're good to go for the spring because you don't even have to buy marigold seeds because these are all ready to go. So if you look at the amount of seeds you get out of one, it is something. So just keep that in mind. So you don't have to buy seeds if you have all these ready to go. And look at the amount of them. I mean, I've already done a ton of seed saving, but all of these are additional seeds as well. And again, here's some chives. This is gonna be fine all year round too. If you, get, you need some chives, just come out and clip it. And again, we've got sage. So any perennial herb is gonna stay in your garden all year round. You know, things just come back, especially if you get a warm spot. We had that, you know, five days of 70 degrees. It's a plant, it loves that type of weather, so it's just gonna come back again. All this organic material, and anything from your kitchen too, I keep that big jar on my counter, so I put the eggshells in it, the peels, anything that's organic material from your kitchen is gonna go in that container, and then it's gonna go right out to your compost system. 
So why don't we take a look at the compost system now. So you want it to be close enough to your house that you can get there, but not so close that you just want it to be far away. So let's walk over here. So this is built, built with pallets and you can get pallets free anywhere, which I love. So you see them on the side of the road. You can pick up pallets for a two bin system or a three bin system. And these we just put together with screws. So on the left hand side, you've got materials that are in the first stage of decomposition. So this is mostly leaves. We've got the stuff from my kitchen that you throw in there. Any of the plant material that I pulled out of the garden, all gonna go in there too. So it's a mixture of the leaves, organic material, and then you need water. So it's rained, which is perfectly great. And then when it gets down to a point where it has decomposed, you move it over to here. So this is like the good soil, all the compost, and look at how yummy that looks. I mean, anybody, any plant's gonna be so happy to have that around it. Or when I put my beds to bed, I'm gonna dress it with this. So you usually just put it into something where you're gonna be able to do a little shake, 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 because sometimes you're gonna get something in there. So I would shake it into another vessel and then that delicious compost is gonna go right onto my garden. So it's good to have something to be able to do a little straining of it. The Black Lives Matter movement sweeping through our nation has inspired many Americans to question their own beliefs and long-held assumptions about race and privilege in America. On May 12th, from 7 to 8 p.m., visit with author Manju Soni and the Plymouth Public Library for Lessons from Apartheid, when Manju will give a brief overview of her experience growing up in South Africa under the system of racial separation and draw parallels with America's own past and present experiences with racism. Register for this free virtual event through the library's website. In our second half of life, many women have raised children, chosen new career paths, and have new financial decisions to make. The Duxbury Senior Center is offering the free program Let's Talk Money with Paula Harris on May 11th at 12.30 p.m. via Zoom. In this workshop, Paula will address Social Security, actionable financial planning steps to ensure your financial stability, and leaving the gift of preparedness for your loved ones. While these issues are commonly faced by women, the content is also relevant to men and all members of the community are invited. To sign up for your slot, visit DuxburySeniorCenter.org and click register for a program. Up next, we have a wonderful cover of Carol King's It's Too Late, performed by South Shore Conservatory faculty Julie Finn, John Finn, Ed Sorrentino, and Peter Munt. Enjoy. Stayed in bed all morning just to pass the time There's something wrong here, there can be no denying One of us is changing or maybe we just stop trying
just can't stay together don't you feel it too still i'm glad for what we had and how i once loved you and it's too late baby now it's too late though we really did try to make it something Don McCasland, the program director at Blue Hill Observatory Science Center, grew up in Foxborough watching his father check the thermograph every morning. In fact, his parents met while his father worked at Blue Hill Observatory in the 1940s. On May 10th, from 6.30 to 8 p.m., join Mr. McCasland and the Kingston Public Library for Watching the Weather at Great Blue Hill, a program featuring photos of the observatory and how it changed between 1885 and 1908, weather instruments from the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, the observed trends and how they relate to climate observations around the world, and stories about some of the more challenging days at the observatory. There will also be plenty of time for questions and answers. This event will take place via Zoom. To register, visit the library's website. For our last story, we move to Pembroke, where the town has come together to honor and grieve the loss of two young men who were both well-known and well-loved in the community. Here's Erica. On April 17th, our community suffered the loss of two exceptional young men, Joe Birolini and Billy Hickey, to a fatal car crash. The Pembroke High School alumni and hockey captains made a lasting impression on all the lives they touched, and they will be sorely missed. Due to COVID-19 safety precautions restricting large public gatherings in the town of Pembroke, PAC-TV was asked to produce an air collaborative tribute so that the community could mourn these two exceptional men together. Hundreds of photos flooded our inboxes to create three photo homages for the tribute. As you watch through these images of their childhood, their passion for hockey, and their lives as adults, their passion, love, and friendships and competitive spirit emanate through the screen. More than 200 decorative bags were laid on the town green in Pembroke Memoriam, with their high school hockey jerseys on display in the center. Live footage from the tribute showed those who came to show their respects as the bags began to light up with the setting sun. A banner hung in the bandstand with their last names and jersey numbers. Testimonials were filmed at the Habamog Hockey Ring, where teammates and friends showed up to share experiences, positive memories, and words of endearment. So many looked up to Joey and Billy. The rink was full of compassion, tears, and pure love. We were able to interview one of the teammates, Jake Morani, and this is what he had to say about his fellow teammates. My name is Jacob Morani, and uh, I grew up with both Joey and Billy Hickey being two of my closest friends. Uh, I'll never forget the memories we got to create together as a family. And I hope both of you are up there protecting and looking over all of us. I love you both with all my hearts, and I always will. Thank you for being my boys, but more importantly, being my family. And you always will forever be. In lieu of flowers, Joe and Billy's families have set up scholarships in their names to benefit students in need. Donations can be made to Pembroke Youth Hockey. Rest in peace. Thank you, Erica. From all of us at PAC-TV, our heartbroken condolences and wish for some semblance of peace for Joe and Billy's family, loved ones, and community. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.